On March 3, 2011, the Jewish Chronicle announced the discovery of dozens of lead books from Jordan. In Jordan, a set of small lead and copper books has been unearthed, stirring curiosity among scientists. These 70 miniature volumes contain inscriptions and symbols that may offer insights into the life of Christ. However, their authenticity is debated, and many are sealed, hindering thorough examination. Despite challenges, studying these books could provide valuable insights into the Christian faith's history. Join us as we explore these ancient artifacts and their potential significance in understanding Christianity's origins. Number 1. The tiny books reveal the first portrait of Jesus. A total of 70 books made of lead have been found containing some interesting things about the Christian faith. The writings and symbols found in these books are speculated to have been written by early Christians. Not much bigger than credit cards, the lead books are bounded by metal rings that connect all the pages together. Christian scholars and historians are already excited about the information this book is set to reveal to believers and atheists at large. Some of the books have already been analyzed in symbols, images, and words that point to the crucifixion and resurrection of the Messiah were found in it. The tiny books are already set to change the course of Christian history as the Dead Sea Scrolls did in 1947. Though the main purpose of this book is not yet clear, the names Jesus and Simon appear in it. The Simon mentioned could either be the man who helped the Messiah carry his cross on the way to his crucifixion, or it could be Simon Bar Kokhba, who led a great rebellion against Rome in 135 CE. Thus, historians view this book as a really ancient artifact, possibly written thousands of years ago. A Wikipedia entry has been made for these books, and they are referred to as codices. The presence of symbols, religious names, and a good number of sealed books among the tiny books led scholars to believe that they could be the lost codices from the Book of Revelation. Found inside a cave in the remote parts of Jordan, researchers have previously discovered important documents in that region because Christian refugees once dwelt there after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Things that were found before this latest discovery were tablets, artifacts, scrolls, and an incense bowl. No one expected to find a book that would shed more light on the already existing Christian scriptures. Symbols of palm trees and the Jewish menorah were found in these books. The language used to inscribe words on these metallic pages was Paleo-Hebrew, a language that dated back a thousand years before the birth of Christ. Analyzing the pages even further, you'll spot some lines of Aramaic there, which was the most popular language in the time of Jesus. These two languages suggest that there was a time gap between the writing of these books. Deeper studies by scholars also found snippets of some Greek characters in the tiny books. While analyzing it day and night, a ray of hope shone on the interpretation when Dr. Samuel Zinner, a member of the evaluation panel, picked up unusual Hebrew characters. He did it by recognizing two characters that were key to unlocking the mystery of reading the texts. These two letters were usually set out on a grid and could be read diagonally, up to down, left to right, and right to left. These helped the team that evaluated the books successfully read some portions of the texts. While going through the remaining portion of the books, there were Jewish symbols, such as the seven-branched lamps, a bowl of temple offerings, eight pointed stars, and a cross that was tilted diagonally. Amid the symbols and characters seen, there was a shocker trapped in the pages of the book. A first-ever portrait of Jesus was seen inside these books. Researchers speculate that the drawing must have been made by someone who lived in the earthly lifetime of Jesus. The image saw the Messiah crowned with thorns on the forehead. Just near the portrait of Jesus laid a text that clearly read, Savior of Israel. Scholars found the seven-branched lamps as one of the most stunning representations in the book. The depiction of it is forbidden by the Jews because it is a sacred object used in Jewish worship. It belonged only to one place inside the temple, the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest was permitted to see it. Researchers found it puzzling that something that was regarded as God's own furniture could be seen and drawn by someone other than the Jewish high priest. Researchers suspect that the presence of this seven-branched menorah was the reason 
Many of the tiny books were sealed away because it contained a forbidden image that shouldn't be seen by the general public. David Elkington took lots of photographs of these books and laid claims on them in a press release in March 2011. It was an exciting discovery for him as he related that the books could be the major discovery of Christian history. Though the dates of the books have not been verified yet, if it were, chances are that it would be among the earliest Christian writings made before the famous letters of Apostle Paul. David Elkington was heard saying that it is a breathtaking thought that we have held these objects that might have been held by the early saints of the church. He faced many skeptics who were unsure about the authenticity of this book as being from the first century and being from actual people who lived during that era. Leading the skeptics were the Jordanian authorities, as they've always seen similar types of books in Cairo, Libya, which have been sold online or used as mere souvenirs. The Jordanian authorities treated these little books made of lead as they treated others. They dismissed it as a forgery. In fact, they spread mocking tales among the locals that the books were found by a grandfather in a cave. Since many people refuse to believe the authenticity of the book, something needs to be done to prove that it was indeed from the first century. All the 70 lead books were subjected to a test. What test could that be? Number 2. Metal books revealed to be older than a hundred years. The tiny books were about to be dismissed finally when a group of nine scholars rose up to verify the worthiness of the books to be studied further. They couldn't risk this rare archaeological find being treated so commonly. This group of scholars operated independently of David Elkington and decided to stamp the authenticity of the lead books. Along with three former presidents of the Society for Old Testament Study, metallurgists, and linguists. So, an evaluation panel was set up to review the results of the tests carried out on these metallic books. Robert Hayward, Professor Emeritus of Hebrew at the University of Durham, lorded over the evaluation panel as its chairman. The nine groups of scholars went to work and organized a series of tests on the tiny books. The major test was to determine how old the metal was, because if the metal is found to be as old as believed, it meant that the writings on it were likely inscribed around that time period. They had to make an observation of the active radiation on the metal. If the metal had no active radiation coming out of it, then it was definitely not a product of this modern era. Professor Webb, one of those carrying out the tests, said that the lead naturally contains a radioactive isotope, which decays away slowly after it has been mined. The lead can be reactivated from radioactive polonium in the air. Professor Webb further explained that all metals forged across the globe from 1945 always contain radioactive polonium because the first atomic bomb was released that year in the deserts of New Mexico, filling the air with radioactive polonium. So if the tiny lead books have no presence of radioactive polonium, it means that they're more than 100 years ago and were made way before 1945. The test results came out highlighting that the lead books are free of radioactive polonium. Further metallurgical analysis by the University of Surrey confirmed that the lead was not less than a hundred years ago, so there could be no possibility of modern forgery. Skeptics have always opined that these books were mere forgeries, but recent tests point to the fact that the leads were more of Roman leads, and also date back to more than a hundred years ago. The leads of the books are highly impure leads, different from how modern leads are made, and no one has ever seen or handled such a kind of lead before. The leads are easily fractured, unlike modern leads. When brought under the scrutiny of a microscope, the leads exhibited all the signs of lead that have aged significantly, such as crystalline impurities clinging onto the lead and microscopic holes appearing inside it. All of these processes take 1,800 years and above to begin. That means that the lead books were really written by the first century Christians. Its authenticity has been proven. It's now worthy of being studied thoroughly by scholars and researchers seeking to know more about the kind of information early Christians shared. Now that the tiny lead books have been proven to be true and not forged, it naturally leads everyone to the next question of why it was made in the first place. Number 3. Uncovering why the books were written. So many scholars have struggled to understand why the codices were written and what information the early church was trying to pass and preserve. 
Many of the books are sealed up to preserve their content, and it makes researchers wonder why someone would pen down information and decide to seal it. Observing how the books were bound by rings on all four sides, some researchers proposed that the books weren't meant to be studied, but to be kept as a talisman. They argued that the forms of some of the letters suggest that they were written after 135 CE, but the items of that letter may have been copied from something older. They were obviously meant to be preserved from one generation to another. Glossing through the contents of the lead books, some scholars were smitten by what they found in them. Philip Davies, a professor emeritus of biblical studies at Sheffield University, said he was dumbstruck because he saw an image that looked so much like a Christian image. He noted that there was a cross in the foreground, and behind it was what looked like a drawing of the tomb of Jesus. There was also a small building with an opening, and behind the building were the walls of a city. Davies observed how walls were illustrated on other pages of the book, and their stark resemblance to Jerusalem. He decided that the depiction in the books was a Christian crucifixion happening outside the city walls. While scholars seek to understand the meaning of the books, they also fear that the Israeli keeper might seek to sell some parts of the books to the black market or destroy them. Nevertheless, that doesn't stop the analysis going on with the tiny lead books. The former president of the Society for Old Testament Study, Dr. Margaret Barker, said that the Book of Revelation tells of a sealed book that was opened only by the Messiah. Explaining further, she said that other texts from the period tell of sealed books of wisdom and of a secret tradition passed on by Jesus to his closest disciples. Dr. Barker maintained that this was the context of the discovery, as she revealed that the possibility of a Hebrew Christian origin is certainly suggested by the imagery, and these codices are likely to bring a dramatic new light to our understanding of a very significant but so far little understood period of history. Lending his voice to Dr. Barker, David Elkington opined that it is vital that the collection can be recovered intact and secured in the best possible circumstances, both for the benefit of its owners and for a potentially fascinating international audience. After much study, scholars and researchers have concluded that the tiny books made of lead were written as testimonials. They were copied out as a weighty document that bore witness to the truth spoken from the lips of the Messiah. Rigorous searches through the contents of the books have led researchers to conclude that the purpose of the characters and imagery is to notify people, past and present, of the coming of the great messianic king who will liberate his people from oppression. Some of the words in the books tell of an incoming liberation from the present world, freedom from having to pay taxes to Caesar, and the massive world dominance the Savior is coming to oversee globally. So many metallic books from the distant past have been found in the past. Some were found to be clever manipulations. Few others were vetted as true, like these tiny books. But what do the pages of the lead books contain? Number four, Dr. Barker read out pages of the lead books. Dr. Margaret Barker has handled lots of books like these little lead books in the past. Now, she has heavily looked into these tiny books that were discovered in Jordan and shares the results of her findings. She notes that most of the pages on the lead books are too corroded to make out the writings inscribed on them. Other pages still had clear writings of the characters and illustrations made on them, and she notes that they are a task for others in the future. The lead books are very small, having almost the same size as a credit or debit card. She reveals the contents of one of the lead books that has been tested, emphatically noting that it couldn't have been made in the last 100 years. The writings and diagrams on the pages were cast on the metallic lead pages, making them stand above the page. For any character to be rewritten, they needed to be recast in the lead tablet. Since no extra words could be added without it being incised on the metal, the copies held by Dr. Barker and the team of scholars are the original or exact copies. Dr. Barker reads two pages out of the lead tablets, and she describes one of the pages as having a menorah, sprouting a pair of leaves at its base. She calls this page the oracle page. The next page contains a stylized drawing of a bee that is the size of a bank card. She calls this second page the bee page. Moving on to another book that's the size of two bank cards, 
she opens a page that depicts a differently shaped menorah with growing branches on either side of it and rows of crosses found at the bottom of the page. At first, when these metal books were unveiled, the layout of diagrams and characters made no sense to anyone. People were quick to dismiss them as useless magic words or talismans, until a friend of Dr. Barker, Dr. Samuel Zinner, noticed that some words weren't cast in lines, but in triangles and clusters. Upon further observation, some of the letters were found to represent more than one letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that was the breakthrough Dr. Barker needed to fit the puzzle of the lead books together. Drawing inspiration from the writings of a Jewish writer, Ben Sira, who wrote in Jerusalem around 200 BCE, Dr. Barker found his words helpful in unraveling the mystery of the books. Ben Sira wrote, Look out on all the works of God. All of them are in pairs, one opposite. She then discovered that some simple words organized in triangles had an exact mirror image that was also a word that made sense, forming a pair with the original word. She also understood more archaic letters that represented more than one letter of the later Hebrew alphabet. Dr. Barker also observed patterns on the menorah page based on pairs with each other. Every word in this pattern had a precise mirror image, reading the pattern around the shape in exactly the same order. She proceeds to reveal 21 patterns on the oracle page and how they were built up. On the oracle page, she found up to 200 of such patterns. Dr. Barker thinks that the information found on the oracle page is an example of what was seen in the first temple in Israel, which is Solomon's temple. She believes the information was made by the priests and prophets after the nation was driven out of Solomon's temple, and it's now rewritten in patterns on the oracle page of the lead books. The content of the lead tablets preserves the worldview of the older priesthood. While describing their current situation, and hope for the future. Many of the writings had their roots in the book of Isaiah. Dr. Barker also revealed that the patterns on the oracle page describe how Adam, the Holy Spirit, Eden, the Messiah, were sent into heaven. There was also some complex geometry which looks like an earlier form of what we now call Pythagoras. The B page contains names of prophets living in exile east of the River Jordan. The writings found preserved the ancient wisdom of those people. The pages of both the Oracle and B page have patterns showing the prophets in exile and their memories of the holy city, Jerusalem. The lead books also point out that the original priests in the temple were metal workers. Metalworking words were used throughout the Hebrew scriptures that were often lost in translation. Saraf is the Hebrew word for refining metals, and it was used as an item of judgment in the scriptures. From the scriptures, we know the Lord is a refiner, so we see words like, I will smelt away your dross in Isaiah 125. I will refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested in Zechariah 13, 9. In Malachi 3, 3, such metalworking words were also used of the Lord as it reads, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi. Isaiah saw seraphim in the temple in his vision in Isaiah 6, 2. But when you use the double letters of the lead books, you find that these seraphim could also have been smelters. Seraph and smelter, though spelled with different Hebrew words, were spelled with the same words on the oracle page. It is recorded that a seraph took hot coal to touch Isaiah's lips. So was that angel a smelter then? It's also important to keep in mind that Aaron was a metal worker who used precious metals to make the golden calf and later the furnishings in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was made of gold, thanks to metal workers who could also be priests. Not just the tabernacle, but all the sacred objects in the temple and tabernacle such as the menorah, the mercy seat, which was known as Kapareth, and the temple utensils. The ark, incense altar, and the table for showbread were also made of gold. All of these needed metal workers to bring them alive. The pages of the lead books also reference that there would be metal workers in the future temple, as stated in Zechariah 118, 21. The word metal workers used in that verse is horsim in Hebrew, which could also mean workers of magic or silent ones. In these lead tablets, silence is an important theme that reverberates throughout the pages. 
The lead pages also mention the riotous times of King Josiah that took place around the end of the 7th century BCE. Inscribed writings stated that Jeremiah was called a prophet in 622 BCE, a year after King Josiah started purging Judah and Jerusalem of idolatry. It was confirmed in the scriptures in 2 Chronicles 34. 3. Jeremiah's call vision came about due to the temple's turmoil. He saw the branch of an almond during his first call vision. The word play for almond in Hebrew is saked, and saked also means, I am watching. So, the meaning of these words from the lead tablet was that the almond was a sign of the Lord's high priest, and the Lord was also watching because Jeremiah was in danger as the true high priest. The second call vision of Jeremiah is always less talked about than the first. It was the vision of a boiling pot. It was literally a blown-on pot. Ironically, this word is also used for a smith at work. So it poses the question as to whether Jeremiah was watching someone melt down metal. And could it also be a part of Josiah's purge? Examining the reflection Josiah had from the purgings when the Lord spoke these words to him, I have made you an assayer and tester among my people, that you may know and assay their ways. The bellow blows fiercely, and the lead is consumed by fire. At this point, note that the word bellow is the same word used for Jeremiah's boiling point. The Lord continued talking to Josiah. In vain, the refiner refines for the wicked are not removed. Dr. Barker observes that this verse implies that wicked people were putting lead into the fire, but the wickedness was not destroyed yet. It would seem that melting lead was a part of Josiah's purge. On the lead tablet pages itself, Dr. Barker shows the archaic double letters on the left and two equivalents in the later Hebrew script on the right. There are seven examples of such writings on a page of the lead tablet, with two archaic double letters written left and its equivalent in later Hebrew written right. Seven rows of such characters. The top letter on the page is Aleph, or a Yon in the latest script, or even both. When looking for a word in these lead tablets, one archaic letter can be read as either Aleph and Yon two letters, possibly read as Aleph Yan Ish Shin, with the word Ish meaning a man. It could also be read in another order, as Aleph you're an olive race, and you're all meaning a stream. A single letter can also be read as a double letter, so you could see an arm symbol. It could also be a double. Dr. Barker then pointed out another drawing cast on the menorah page. She observed that the letters could be written facing either left or right, there is a character there which is pronounced as Dalit or Gimel. Three of them were found. One of them on the right faces one way, and the two on the left are written sideways and face the other way. Amid these characters on the menorah page stands a large depiction of the menorah, which represents the Lord, and there are patterns that intersect at the central lamp of the menorah. That pattern reveals the Lord and the Messiah. Dr. Barker showed another letter that appeared three times, which is pronounced as Aleph. There's also an inverted Greek letter known as Omega, and it always represents the vowel, O. Moving on to the other page, the B page, Dr. Barker then reveals three letters. Among them are B and Q, or an R, which is a code word for race. These characters make for interesting readings. Back to the oracle page. The large menorah also symbolizes the description of the temple's worldview. The central area and characters captured above the square and menorah are heaven, and the characters below the menorah are the earth. Each of these illustrations has lines that give an idea of their positions within the temple, and that's the most remarkable feature of the lead tablets. To illustrate this, Dr. Barker shows us a character on the left side of the menorah, which means either a shoot or a branch. It could be seen growing up from the earth area of the diagram into the Holy of Holies. Looking at it in reverse as it comes down from the Holy of Holies, it depicts a character symbolism of divine favor. On the right side of the menorah, there is the mirror word for this character, which means a shoot or a branch. And as it goes upward, it reads the message, My Witness. As the mirror word comes down, it now captures a different message that reads, The One Who Knows. The meaning of those characters reveals that the person called the branch, which is the Messiah, 
is also the Lord's witness, and he goes into the Holy of Holies and comes out with divine knowledge and favor. This is confirmed in Isaiah's popular word, which says that I have made him a witness to the people. Thanks for watching to the end to discover the contents of the lead books found in Jordan. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more interesting video content.